Greetings, mother factors. My name is Sam, and today I'll be strapping on my headset and stepping into the wonderfully weird world of virtual reality. VR is quickly becoming the most immersive way to completely put yourself into video games. And even YouTube now lets you watch videos in 360 whopping degrees. I mean, we do it for this one, but it just, I mean, it wouldn't work. It's impossible to submit the format. But what was the first VR headset invented? Are there any VR headsets for your pets? And at what point will virtual reality become better than real reality? Because at the moment, standards are really slipping. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered in this very 2D video. Sorry for VR users. So get ready to get dizzy with motion sickness as we dive head first into 101 facts about virtual reality. Number one. Virtual reality, or VR, is a computer-generated simulation of an image or environment that can be interacted with using special electronic equipment, such as a visor or a headset. The aim is to use technology to simulate a realistic experience, though the experience itself may be fictional, such as fighting zombies or going on a date with Jennifer Lawrence, and we're really hitting it off and playing footsie under the table and oh wait no, that's a lava lamp, I've kicked over my lava lamp and there's wax everywhere. I'm in excruciating pain. Next fact. Number two. By that definition, things like curved panoramic paintings and stereoscopic photos are technically the earliest ancestors of virtual reality. All such rudimentary forms of augmenting visuals are the first proper attempts to create an audience experience that is more than just merely viewing art or events. Number 3. In 1929, a fellow by the name of Edward Link created the Link Trainer, the very first commercial flight simulator. The simulator was entirely electromechanical, controlled by motors that controlled the pitch and roll, in addition to a small motor-driven device that mimicked disturbances like turbulence. During World War II, over 10,000 Link trainers were used by over half a million pilots to train and improve their piloting skills. Number 4. The following year saw the release of a number of books containing the first ideas for modern virtual reality tech. All the way back in 1933, for example, Lawrence Manning published a series of short stories entitled The Men Who Awoke, which told the story of a world in which people connect to themselves to a machine that replaces all their senses with electrical impulses, allowing them to live a virtual life of their choosing. Ready player what? Nope, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Number five. In 1935, Stanley G. Weinbaum released Figmalion Spectacles, which described virtual reality goggles capable of displaying a movie with which participants could interact, allowing them to talk to characters, which would, in turn, answer back. Number six. The first real attempt to create virtual reality technology that worked alongside a screen came from pioneering multimedia specialist Morton Halig. In the 1950s, Halig wrote about Experience Theatre, which would involve all the main senses, and in 1962, he created a prototype of his vision that was widely regarded as the first ever VR machine, which Halig called the Sensorama. Number 7. The Sensorama was a giant beast of a machine that involved the user putting their head inside a tunnel, which in turn was over a screen to create a sense of immersion. The machine allowed the viewer to use a small joystick to look around a video recording, with a fan blowing in their face to give the feeling of travelling at high speeds. Number 8. Not only that, the Sensorama featured smell facilitators. This technique was mirrored in Smellovision, released around the same time. Number 9. Sadly, the cost of the Sensorama production and the creation of the films used within it were far too high for the machine to ever be profitable, and Halig was never able to sell the machine to potential buyers. However, he is often credited as being one of the original creators of what we now know as VR. Number 10. Halig also developed the Telesphere Mask, the first example of a HMD or head-mounted display. However, though the headset provided stereoscopic 3D and wide vision with stereo sound, the technology was entirely a non-interactive film medium with zero motion tracking. Number 11. In 1961, two Philco Corporation engineers developed the Headsight, the first HMDs we know today. It had separate screens for each eye and, unlike the Telesphere mask, incorporated a motion tracking system, allowing the user to look naturally around their environment. Number 12. The next step was to connect such a system to a computer rather than a camera, an advance which came from Ivan Sutherland, a professor at the University of Utah. In 1965, Sutherland described the ultimate display, which would feature interactive graphics and force feedback devices. Number 13. In 1968, with his student Bob Sproul, Sutherland put his plans into action. Their creation was capable of displaying a computer-based imagery on a head mount, though the machine was incredibly primitive and could only display wireframe objects. Number 14. Not only that, the machine was also insanely heavy. So heavy, in fact, it had to be held from the ceiling by giant poles. This led to the machine being called the Sword of Damocles, a reference to the mythological sword that hung precariously above an obsequious courtier of Dionysus II of Syracuse. Number 15. 
In 1969, early virtual reality researcher and owner of a delightfully old-fashioned name, Myron Krugier, developed a series of projects which he called Artificial Reality. Oh, you're one word off. So close, though. These experiments ultimately led to the development of Video Place Technology, which enabled people to communicate with each other in an interactive CGI environment, despite being miles apart. Number 16. The next strange VR experiment came in 1978 with the Aspen Movie Map. It was developed at MIT of all places with funding from the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, also known as DARPA. But what is it, I hear you ask? Well, I have a feeling the next fact's gonna tell ya. Number 17. It is gonna tell ya. The Aspen Movie Map was a VR interactive tour of the city of Aspen in Colorado. It allowed viewers to explore the city similar to how we use Google Street View now, only with three frames per second video. Users were treated to viewing Aspen in three different ways, sun, snow, or my personal favorite, in wireframe. Number 18. The 1980s saw the arrival of the actual term virtual reality, which was popularized by computer scientist and white guy with dreads, Darren Lanier. Lanier is also an artist and composer of classical music, making him an all-round impressive guy who is making the rest of us look bad. Number 19. In 1985, Lanier founded VPL Research, a company that developed several VR devices, such as the Data Glove, the Audiosphere, and the iPhone. Now, you may be thinking, oh, uh, wasn't that Steve Jobs? Oh, you silly mother factors, you. Jobs created the iPhone. Lanier created the iPhone, which was a HMU which used LCD screens to create an immersive environment. Number 20. VPL Research eventually licensed the Data Glove technology to the toy company Mattel, who used it to create the Power Glove, released in 1989. At $75 a pop, it was one of the first affordable VR devices. Sadly though, the Power Glove was also difficult to use and lacked the sensitivity of making it not suck as a toy, leading it to miserable sales of only 100,000 units in the US before being discontinued. Number 21. In the mid-1980s, NASA, those crazy guys who we seem to mention every week, developed the Virtual Interface Environment Workstation, or VIEW for short. <laughs> They're good at acronyms, aren't they? The technology combined a head-mounted device with gloves, enabling haptic interaction. Number 22. <laughs> you may be wondering, uh, what is haptic interaction, and why did you react to that so sexy? Well, when you actually think about it, even simple gadgets like rumble packs are a form of virtual reality, as they're a method of simulating a realistic experience from turbulence. Such devices are known as haptic technology, which comes from the Greek verb hapistai, meaning to touch. That's where the sexy comes in. Number 23. The early 90s welcomed the arrival of more virtual reality devices, which were easily accessible by the public. In 1991, the Virtuality Group released their self-titled Virtuality range of virtual reality gaming machines. Players either stood or sat in gaming pods and wore VR goggles to play on games with the mercy of real-time 3D visuals. Some units were also networked together, enabling a no-doubt thrilling multiplayer gaming experience. Where was I for this? All I had in the 90s was like a Game Boy, and I only got that so I could play it at the swimming pool while my brother was having swimming lessons. Number 24. The Lawnmower Man, a movie released in 1992, introduced the concept of virtual reality to a wider audience, and was partially based on the early days of virtual reality term coiner, Jaron Lanier. Lanier's equivalent in the movie, Dr. Lawrence Angelo, played by Pierce Brosnan, was a scientist who used virtual reality therapy on a mentally disabled patient. I thought it was about lawn mowing, but what do I know? Number 25. In the early 90s, students at the University of Illinois created the Cave Automatic Virtual Environment, which utilized wall projections and stereoscopic LCD shutter glasses to create three walled spaces in which you could stand to experience a highly immersive virtual environment. Essentially, it was a room with a virtual reality world projected onto the walls, and constituted VR technology that didn't entirely rely on headsets. Number 26. This concept was mirrored by French artist Maurice Benayoun, with his 1997 creation, World Skin. Betty Yoon's virtual reality interactive installation again featured walls onto which virtual worlds were projected. And it must have been good too, because it won the Golden Eco Award in the Interactive Art category in 1988. Good for you, Betty Yoon. Number 27. At the Consumer Electronics Show in 1993, Sega announced new VR glasses for the Sega Genesis console, which would feature head tracking, stereo sound, and LCD screens in the visor. You may be thinking, I don't remember those, and you're right not to, because technical development difficulties prevented the product from ever getting past the prototype phase, despite the fact that Sega had developed several games for the product already. <sighs> Orcs. Number 28. The Nintendo Virtual Boy, released in 1995, was hyped as the first ever portable console that would display true 3D graphics. It was first released in Japan and North America at a price of $180, but despite price drops, it was a commercial failure. Owing to a lack of colour, lack of software support, and the fact it was uncomfortable, it was discontinued only a year later. Number 29. 
One of the most notable HMDs was the Cybermax by Victimax, which featured an LCD screen embedded in a visor, as well as a head tracking system and a colorful stereoscopic 3D. With a price tag that was a bit below $1,000, it's perhaps not surprising that the Cybermax didn't achieve the huge success its creators probably wanted. Number 30. A similar virtual reality headset from the 90s was the VFX-1. With stereoscopic 3D, multi-axis head motion tracking, and the ability to play games that were not truly supported by the system, the VFX-1 was one of the most impressive VR headsets available at the time. Not only that, the system was relatively cheap compared to other products, available at the low price of $600. And yet, the VFX-1 also failed to be a hit. Not only that... Number 31... The same company followed the VFX-1 with a more expensive 3D version imaginatively titled the VFX-3D, but it also flopped like a tased penguin. Noticing a pattern here? Number 32. Even though Apple is known for its market-dominating eye product, they actually weren't the first to do it. In 1995, several years before the release of the first iMac, a company by the name of Virtual I.O. released the iGlasses, a headset capable of full-color 3D stereoscopic vision and motion tracking. Again, this VR product was not successful. 90s just swallowed them right up like a ravenous, well, anything that's ravenous, really. Number 33. So why was the 90s so hostile to virtual reality? Well, part of the reason why early VR technology flopped so often was due to the outrageous price tags. Those eyeglasses I mentioned just a second ago sold for just under $1,000, and that was relatively cheap. Prices for various versions of the aforementioned iPhone, for example, range from just under $10,000 to a truly offensive $49,000. Number 34. The brutal 90s VR floppage was also a direct result of the technology being extremely overhyped. Very often, these systems simply couldn't deliver the quality people assume most products would have, which must have been really annoying, especially if you'd paid almost 50 grand for one. Number 35. In 1999, the iconic sci-fi film The Matrix was released, which suggested that the real world as we all experience it is in fact a vast computer simulation, a virtual reality, if you will. Though previous films had dealt with similar concepts, The Matrix was groundbreaking in its depiction of an all-encompassing virtual world that we may be entirely unaware is completely fake and everything we do is meaningless and oh god, I'm spiralling, I'm spiralling! Ah! Next fact! Number 36. Fast forward to 2007, when Google introduced Street View, an online service that shows panoramic views of, well, pretty much everywhere. As long as it's accessible via public roads, that is. Initially, Street View was only available in most built-up cities in the world, but the service has since been rolled out to large areas of the globe. It also features stereoscopic 3D mode, introduced in 2010. Number 37. One of the most well-known modern VR consoles is a somewhat ominously titled Oculus Rift, the first prototype for which was designed in 2010, before being promoted on a Kickstarter campaign in 2012, which raised just under 2.5 million. Noice. Number 38. Oculus Rift obviously became a huge success, which was evident when the social media juggernaut Facebook purchased the company in 2014 for the staggering sum of $2 billion. Shame, they could have spent that on chicken nuggets, but instead, Oculus Rift. Number 39. The creator of the Oculus Rift, Palmer Lucky, is known to be a bit of a kook. He was homeschooled, which is already a red flag, and instead of taking courses in something techy like computer science or robotics, he instead studied journalism at California State. The soles of his feet are dark because he hates wearing shoes, even outdoors, and if you Google his name, there are far more shirtless pics than you'd ordinarily expect. Number 40. Not only the team at Oculus Rift creating amazing VR content, in 2015 the company announced they have surpassed 200,000 registered developers in Oculus Development Center. Number 41. Not to be outdone, Sony announced Project Morpheus in the very same month. Project Morpheus turned out to be PlayStation VR, a virtual reality headset for the PlayStation 4 video game console which I've got and I'm obsessed with. While other VR headsets like the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive require high-end computer systems, PlayStation VR only requires a PS4 console. In just over a year, PlayStation VR sold over 2 million units. The, the meaning, meaning of life. life. At the very, very cheap end of the VR hardware spectrum is the Google Cardboard, which is literally just a cardboard box with some lenses in it. The screen is provided by the user by fitting the Google Cardboard with a smartphone with compatible apps installed. God, what kind of tech company invests loads in cardboard? Oh, show them Nintendo Labo there, Chris. Number 43. The Google Cardboard platform was developed by David Carlson and Damien Henry, two Google employees who developed the project as part of Google's Innovation Time Off program, which encourages engineers to spend some of their time working on projects that interest them. Number 44. And the Google Cardboard, let me tell you, has not suffered from the sluggishness of the mid-90s virtual reality. In 2016, Google sold approximately 88 million sets of Google Cardboard VR headsets. Number 45. 
In 2015, Samsung became the first smartphone company to dive into the turbulent world of virtual reality with the release of the Galaxy Gear VR. Like the Google Cardboard, the Galaxy Gear utilizes a smartphone, in this case the Samsung Galaxy, rather than a built-in screen. Number 46. This appears to be a relatively successful strategy, as in 2016, almost 90% of the virtual reality headsets sold across the globe were mobile phone-based. Number 47. In 2015, the Kickstarter campaign for Glove One was successfully funded, with over $150,000 in contributions. Glove One is constituted by a pair of gloves, which provide motion tracking and haptic feedback, essentially allowing users to feel virtual reality objects. Number 48. In March of 2015, YouTube began to allow users to upload and view 360-degree videos, both on the desktop and mobile versions of their site. This enabled much greater accessibility for virtual reality content, and not only that... Dot, dot, dot. Number 49. YouTube also had its own dedicated virtual reality channel, which features all the latest and greatest VR vids on the site. The channel currently has over 2.8 million subscribers. Number 50. In September of the same year, Facebook, who you'll remember own Oculus Rift, followed suit and added 360-degree video support. In March of 2017, Facebook announced that in less than two years, more than 1 million 360-degree videos have been uploaded to their site. Snaz. Number 51. According to Facebook, within only three months of the release of the Samsung Gear VR headset, users had already watched more than 1 million hours of video. Number 52. VR headset sales have continued to rise to such a degree that in 2017, it was reported that quarterly sales of VR headsets had topped 1 million units for the first time ever. Oh, that was too much business talk. I need to sit down now. Number 53. Of these sales, Sony sold roughly 490,000 PlayStation VR units, which, for the less mathematically adept of you, works out at 49% of total VR headset shipments. The Facebook-owned Oculus Rift took silver with 210,000 units sold, and HTC's Vive found itself in third place, selling 160,000. Number 54. Smarty Pants business people have predicted that by 2020, global revenues from virtual reality will be close to 20 billion American bucks. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that's a lot of the old nugs of the chickens variety. Number 55. A study conducted in 2015 found that around three quarters of the Forbes world's most valuable brands have created some form of virtual reality or augmented reality for their customers or employees, or are developing these technologies themselves. In other words, big brands are into VR, and so should you be. Number 56. A survey of adults in the US conducted in 2017 sought to reveal how the average person actually perceives and interacts with modern VR technology. It discovered that pretty much exactly one third, 33%, of participants had already tried a virtual reality headset. What about you? Have you ever tried a VR headset? Are you watching this in VR now, for example? It's quite silly if you are, but hey, let me know in the poll up above. Number 57. It also found that the thing people found most intriguing about virtual reality tech was the feeling of entering another world. Fun fact, the same effect can be achieved with certain tr Oh, uh, okay. Not allowed to say that? Cool. They're illegal and sometimes very dangerous? Yep, absolutely. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, virtual reality technology, then, everyone. Use that instead. Number 58. Not only that, when people were asked to rate their experience of using virtual reality headsets as very exciting, over 30% of respondents give mucking about with a VR a perfect 10 out of 10. 13% gave VR 9 out of 10, and 19% of people rated their experience as about an 8, meaning that the majority of people love VR, and if you don't, you're probably old and weird. Number 59. A number of studies have attempted to observe how virtual reality affects the way users behave, and what it tells us about human nature in general. One study into virtual reality platforms found that users who embody the persona of a young child perceived various objects as being much larger than individuals embodying adults. Number 60. Additionally, some studies have found that virtual reality can also make you less prejudiced. When one such study placed light-skinned people in avatars with dark skin, these individuals displayed a reduction of their implicit racial bias. Good. Number 61. Not only that, another study found that people who embodied the personas of old people in virtual reality programs demonstrated a significant reduction in negative stereotyping of the elderly when comparatively placed in the body of a young person. Number 62. Speaking of unfair bias against old, wrinkly people who are all boring and bitter, according to research by Greenlight VR and Touchstone Research, it's not just us millennials who are interested in VR either. Apparently, almost two-thirds of baby boomers have positive feelings about virtual reality, which is more than I expected, actually, probably because I'm biased against baby boomers. Number 63. That being said, young people really are at the forefront of modern virtual reality tech. One study found that only 4% of consumers between the ages of 14 and 19 claim to have no interest in virtual reality. To be fair, only 6% of those aged between 20 and 39 weren't interested either. Basically, pretty much everyone's interested. Nintendo 64. 
Interestingly, other studies have found that interest in virtual reality does to a certain extent run along gender lines. One such investigation found that 82% of men believe that VR technology will have a positive effect on their lives, compared to 69% of women. Not only that, women are also more wary of virtual reality products, with 47% of women reporting that they are worried about the impact of VR on family and mental health, compared to only 39% of men who simply don't give an F. Number 65 This is reflected in the fact that virtually all online buyers of VR tech are men with only 14% of virtual reality purchases being made by women. Ladies, get on board! Virtual reality is a good thing, and definitely won't result in the real-life version of that terrible Bruce Willis movie, Surrogates. God damn, that movie was awful, and now I'm thinking about it again. It's so shit. Number 66. This bias could be fueled by a perception that VR is mainly useful for industries that are stereotypically male-oriented. Research indicates that 60% of people believe that gamers are the main target audience for virtual reality technology. It's certainly the most fun. Number 67. Of course, while gaming is certainly a huge market for the application of VR, and not just for boys, I should add, the possibilities go far beyond just gaming. Virtual reality has applications for travel, education, architecture, and even healthcare. It's even been utilized in therapy, in particular, helping people overcome phobias. Number 68. The website YouVisit.com utilizes virtual reality to simulate travel experiences, allowing customers to do all manner of things. One of the most interesting applications is virtual reality campus tours. Prospective students are able to tour possible universities remotely, which is useful because... Dot, dot, dot. Number 69. Haptic feedback. When British travel company Thomas Cook offered a New York City virtual reality experience in their stores, bookings to the city increased by a staggering 190%. Number 70. Following the introduction of an advertising campaign that utilized virtual reality technology, Amnesty International reported a 16% increase in direct debit donations. Number 71. In 2018, a company by the name of Black Box VR has created a virtual reality gym, which blends all the fun and wonder of virtual reality with all the disgusting physical activity of exercise. The company claims that the gamification aspect of the virtual gym makes it easier to stick to rather than regular fitness programs. Then again, they said that about the Wii Fit, and they're mostly just in skips now. Number 72. Virtual reality is also being utilized in the realm of healthcare in a range of ways. By combining images from CAT scans and ultrasounds, healthcare professionals have been able to create 3D virtual models compatible with VR tech, allowing surgeons to decide the best point of entry for surgical incisions with a greater accuracy than previously possible. Number 73. Not only that, but virtual reality technology now allows medical students to practice cutting people open and filling about with their insides to make them not die without having to use a cadaver or a real person. Number 74. Virtual reality headsets are also being used to help autistic people. By allowing interaction with virtual conversation partners in a calm, no-pressure environment, users build valuable social skills to help them become more self-sufficient. Number 75. Virtual reality technology can also be used to make children slightly less awful. Where applicable, because some kids are great. One study found that involving VR tech in lessons increased student attention by an incredible 90%. Not only that, but actual assessment results also improved by 35%. Number 76. Virtual reality is used in the treatment of soldiers, emergency workers, and civilians suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Participants are repeatedly placed into virtual reality recreations of traumatic scenarios, including war zones, natural disasters, and even inside the World Trade Center during the 9-11 attacks. This acts as a form of exposure therapy, which forces sufferers to confront their traumatic memories again and again and again until they literally become bored with them, reducing their anxiety. Number 77. Virtual reality has also been used to help amputees afflicted by phantom limb pain. Participants are placed into virtual scenarios in which they use both hands to complete tasks, which is often enough to trick the brain into thinking the limb is still there, reducing pain and discomfort. Number 78. Of course, virtual reality has also found applications in the military. These range from recruitment tools similar to the aforementioned VR campus tours, but also within the actual training of soldiers prior to being deployed. Virtual reality allows potential soldiers to train in immersive virtual environments without having to actually worry about being, you know, killed, or killing the wrong person, or going AWOL due to shell shock, you know, all that fun stuff. Number 79. Not only that, but virtual reality has also made its way into the coolest of all possible arenas, space. Scientists at NASA have utilized virtual reality to operate robot arms in space. This allows complex actions to be carried out by operators on Earth without having to go all the way to space. Number 80. If you don't happen to be a literal astronaut, which, well, I'm certainly not, there are also numerous VR apps that you can download to your phone to virtually launch you into virtual outer space. Virtually. You can explore the cosmos, sail across the sun, or fall from a shooting star. Just be careful in case Venus blows your mind. Number 81. 
Virtual reality also has more... Um... Adult applications. A apparently. I mean, I've heard. Yes, we're talking about virtual reality adult naughty movies. Numerous virtual adult movies have been created, and there are even companies dedicated to making VR adult movies specifically, such as the inventively named Kamasutra VR. Well done. Good, good, great work there. These titles are usually shot in a point of view style, allowing users to sort of kind of believe they're having a tough with an adult film star, but not really. Number 82. Virtual reality technology can also be used to give geographically isolated partners the ability to be intimate. Immersive VR headsets combined with haptic technology for your, uh, you know, allow couples separated by the entire ocean to make sweet, beautiful love. Number 83. Of course, anyone who's used virtual reality will be aware of the possible side effects, namely massive headaches and feeling like you're going to throw up all over the coffee table or chaise lounge, whatever. One reason for this could be that you're forcing your eyes to report that you're hurting through the air on a roller coaster while the rest of your body is telling your brain that your fat ass is stuck on the sofa as per usual. Only joking about the ass, by the way, yours is probably lovely. Luckily, researchers are already figuring out ways to combat VR sickness. For instance, number 84. Some clever diggers figured out that the secret of reducing VR sickness has been right in front of us all along. Ordinarily, humans can see their nose at all times. The brain just ignores it, so you're not just seeing noses all day, like I will now that I've mentioned it. However, in VR, the nose is usually not visible, which creates a problem for your brain, which has been constantly ignoring it for years, causing headaches. Adding a virtual nose to VR allows the brain to see it and ignore it as usual, resulting in less headaches. Brains are weird. <laughs> you should really check out our video on them. Number 85. As a result of all these discoveries, much of the current scientific investigation involving virtual reality technology concerns the way in which human senses work with each other, because clearly, basically, whenever we use VR tech, we're making one sense think we're doing something that another doesn't. So our brains just kind of give up and start giving us headaches. Thanks, brain. Number 86. Virtual reality can be seen as the technological cousin of AR, or augmented reality. While virtual reality creates a virtual world for users, augmented reality overlays virtual elements onto the real world. The most famous example of this is probably Pokemon Go, which managed to generate hundreds of millions of revenue in just a matter of days. Number 87. For all you proud nerds out there, you'll probably already know about the battle for Avengers Tower, an awesome VR experience created for the launch of the Samsung S6, which puts you front and center in the midst of an intense superhero skirmish against Ultron's minions. Number 88. In 2015, American Express created You vs. Sharapova, a VR experience that enabled tennis fans to live out their dreams of playing opposite now disgraced tennis legend Maria Sharapova, although we should point out she wasn't disgraced at the time. This seems like an odd venture for a multinational financial services giant, but hey, you do you, Amex. You do you. Number 89. In early 2018, an artist by the name of Carlos Franklin created a VR interpretation of The Triptych of the Temptation of St. Anthony, an artwork by Hieronymus Bosch. If you don't know anything about Hieronymus Bosch, his work is well known for bizarre, unsettling religious imagery, with many of his pieces basically representing a bad LSD trip, ahem, uh, I assume. Franklin's virtual reality recreation of St. Anthony contains demons, flying fish, and an arse cave. Yep, an arse cave. How fun. Number 90. Probably one of the most interesting virtual reality experiences is Birdly, created to mimic as closely as possible what it may feel like to fly like a bird. Nelly Furtado style. Created by researchers at Zurich University's Interaction Design Program, Birdly goes beyond just wearing a VR headset. Users are strapped into a padded rig complete with large flappable wings, allowing them to soar through the clouds or just above a sprawling city like an actual avian. The apparatus even has a fan at the front, so users can really feel the wind in their feathers. Number 91. In 2016, the online music broadcasting platform Boiler Room announced plans to create their first virtual reality music venue, which they claim will allow users to experience, and I'm quoting them exactly here, a sweaty rave halfway across the world. Sounds lovely. Number 92. For the past two years, US Olympic skiers and snowboarders have been working with Striver, a Californian VR training setup. The system allows them to train without the inconvenience of having to hang around mountains like that loser, the Abominable Snowman. No one likes you, Abominable Snowman! Despite the fact I can't say your name. Number 93. Numerous academics, commentators, and researchers have claimed that virtual reality will be the final and most advanced form of communication that humanity will ever experience. If virtual reality can be developed to the point that it's functionally indistinguishable from actual reality, well, not much further to go than that, right? <laughs> Number 94. Many people within the virtual reality industry believe that their ultimate goal for truly immersive VR is to completely abandon physical controllers altogether, and instead to use full body tracking to make your body the input device. Wink. Technology like this already exists in devices like the Xbox Kinect, so integrating these systems into VR likely isn't too far away. 
Perhaps one day, not only will we get rid of controllers, but headsets too, allowing us to exist forever in a virtual world free from jobs and money. And here's Morgan. Number 95. However, not everyone is convinced. People tried to introduce film director and literal deep sea explorer James Cameron to VR, but he simply stated he had no use for it, with a colleague of his claiming that VR has very little to do with controlling the viewer's attention, and that it's not necessarily a medium for filmmakers. We'll see about that, Jimmy Cam. We'll see about that. Number 96. As virtual reality tech has risen in prominence, it's begun to be featured not only as a novelty in news segments, but as a regular feature on popular TV shows. For instance, Jimmy Fallon, the second best Jimmy on late night television, has a recurring game segment on The Tonight Show called Virtual Reality Pictionary, in which celebrities play Pictionary in 3D space, rather than on, you know, a flat surface. Notable participants include Scarlett Johansson, Orlando Bloom, Kate McKinnon and Patton Oswalt. Number 97. In 2016, American chat show host Conan O'Brien actually visited YouTube's VR lab, in which he drew a cartoon version of himself in 3D space, while also working in a virtual reality office, and battled numerous waves of hostile droids while playing Space Pirate Trainer. Number 98. As VR has arisen from its rocky start and near death in the 90s, literature which engages with the topic has also developed, often having a direct influence on the progress of VR tech itself. Neil Stevenson's 1992 novel Snow Crash deals with a number of issues and concepts surrounding VR, and was so well received that Stevenson was later hired by virtual and augmented reality startup Magic Leap based on his work. Number 99. There is a virtual reality documentary called Six by Nine, which places audiences into a virtual reality prison cell. While it may not be the most exciting use for VR, the idea is to more faithfully represent a prison environment by placing audiences in solitary confinement, as they hear stories from real inmates about their experiences. <laughs> the animated short film Pearl, produced by Google Spotlight Stories and Evil Eye Pictures, was the first ever virtual reality film to be nominated for an Oscar. The short is currently available to experience for free on the HTC Vive, and has been described as part music video, part road movie. So it's crossroads with Pretty Spears, right? <laughs> God, that movie's great. Number 101. In 2016, the animated VR short story Henry, which tells the story of a lovable but lonely hedgehog who throws himself a birthday party, won an Emmy for Best Outstanding Original Interactive Program. Henry was the first VR production to win an Emmy. Well done, Henry, and hey, let's hope we can see more of those. I'm starring Jennifer Lawrence, please. Anyway, that was 101 Facts About Virtual Reality. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you? Let me know in the comments below. Also, what would you like to see next? Let me know in the comments below too. And you guys are going to love one of these two videos that's on screen right now. Four. They're chosen especially for you. So go ahead, pick one, and I'll see you next time. Bye.